So yeah, this is going to be the second part of the talk on um, counting uh, simple closed multigeodesics on hyperbolic surfaces with respect to lengths of their individual components. And yeah, this is part of the nearly carbon neutral geometric topology conference. Um, so yeah, so this is the second part. And as I said in the first part, uh, the main idea of this part is to explain uh, what these expanding horribles are in the setting of our counting problem, not in the, uh, uh, and it's going to be motivated by the setting of lattices, but uh, the focus is our counting problem, and describe what the equidistribution phenomena looks like in this case, and how would you go about to prove that, because that's at, as was explained in the previous part, in the first part of this uh, two-part talk, uh, it's sort of the main idea driving uh, a lot of the things. Yeah. So um, to do that, let me begin by explaining what a distribution looks like in the classical setting, in a very classical setting. Um, so we're going to look at H2. That's going to be a hyperbolic plane. I'm going to draw it as the upper half space. Gamma is going to be the modular group. So that's going to be SL2Z acting on H2 by uh, Mobius transformations. And finally, uh, we're going to look at the modular curve, which is going to be H2 mod gamma. Yeah. So let me just draw a picture of the usual fundamental domain we can see here for uh, such an action. And uh, what I want to do is I want to describe what uh, these expanding families of horribles look in this picture. So maybe let me leave H2 there and let me draw the modular curve over here, so the quotient. And uh, a horrible uh, based at infinity is going to be the shaded region that I drew here. So everything that lies above a certain line and for a given parameter L, I'm going to take everything that lies above 1 over n. And that's what a uh, horrible base at infinity is going to be. And now we can also draw this on the modular curve. And so the idea here is that as I take this parameter L going to infinity, uh, this horrible is going to, this line is going to approach more and more the real axis. And so this horrible is going to, so this starts going lower and lower and so on. And so this horrible is going to start dropping around more and more over the surface, yeah? And sort of the question is, does it equidistribute, meaning does the sort of horrible that's expanding visit each place of the surface uh, with the right proportion given by the area? Yeah, so that's sort of the question. And to give a statement of a theorem uh, of this sort, we would need to, uh, we would need to, find a tool to keep track of how these uh, horribles are wrapping over our surface and we're going to do that using measures. Uh, so a natural way to do that would be to consider uh, on H2 a measure keeping track of the horrible would be uh, the area of uh, the hyperbolic plane restricted to the shaded region and that's perfectly fine. And maybe then one might think that the correct measure to consider down here in the bottom would be the push forward of that measure uh, through this quotient map. Uh, but that's not going to be useful uh, because such a measure is not even locally finite and the reason why it's not locally finite is that when you're pushing forward uh, there's this whole uh, redundancy or periodicity in this case of this picture so this whole picture is invariant under uh, the transformation which translates by one uh, to the left and to the right and so if I have that periodicity which when I take push forward is going to make my measure not be even locally finite so that's a problem, but it has a solution, which is to go through an intermediate cover, and that's what I'm going to draw here. So instead of going directly to this quotient, what I want to do is I want to consider the, uh, I want to get rid of these redundancies, or I want to quotient out this, uh, this uh, periodicity that I don't want, and um, that's what this quotient does. So the stabilizer at infinity of SL2Z is uh, exactly the transformation z maps to z plus one. Uh, I mean, the group generated by that. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to first go to this intermediate cover. I'm going to take this area restricted to the shaded region. I'm going to consider a local push forward to land here and get a measure here. And then I'm going to push forward that measure downstairs to get a meaningful measure that's going to keep track of how this horrible is wrapping around this modular surface. And just to make it more clear, when I say local push forward uh, to this map, I just mean restrict to one of these strips. So restrict to the strip uh, here. Consider just uh, sort of the 
shaded region inside that strip, push that measure down here, and then push that uh, forward down here. Yeah. And that way we're gonna get a measure that's sort of keeping track of how these horrible wraps around our surface. And uh, let me just give names to everything that I said. So for every positive L, I'm gonna consider the horrible base at infinity to be all points in the upper half space whose imaginary part is above one over L. That horrible carries a natural measure, which is just the area restricted to that horrible. That's what I draw here, the area of the hyperbolic plane. And the procedure that I mentioned before is described in the following diagram. So I have my horrible measure on H2. I take a local push forward to H2 modulo the stabilizer at infinity. So this is quotienting out the Z maps to Z plus one map. And after that, I can push forward down to H2 mod gamma and actually one can compute that I get a measure which is finite. Yeah. And that measure, what it's gonna do, it's gonna keep track of how these horribles as I go make them go deeper and deeper into the surface and they start sort of wrapping around more and more uh, how they are sort of visiting each place. And so an equidistribution statement, which is what we're looking for, would look like the following. And um, this theorem can be deduced from work of Margulis and Sarnak, but uh, what I'm gonna state here is much weaker than what they prove. Uh, so the idea is that if you consider the weak star topology for measures on the modular curve, uh, what we're going to see is that uh, these are the horrible measures. Uh, after I normalize them to be a probability measure, and you can compute that the total measure is L, then they equidistribute with respect to the area of the modular curve, and pi over 3 here is just the right normalization to get a probability measure. Yeah. So after making everything a probability measure, we have equidistribution uh, of our horrible measures uh, to uh, the area, which is sort of what we want. And uh, let me again remark that I just want to be fair with what I say. Uh, Margulis and Sarnak's work is much uh, stronger in general than what I'm saying here. I'm just sort of stating uh, the version that's going to be enough for uh, our motivation. Yeah. So this result is just saying that uh, using these measures to keep track of how these horribles uh, wrap around our surface, then we actually witness equidistribution. And now what I want to do is explain how this equidistribution looks in our case. So let's go back to our original setting. So we're going to have a surface of genus G bigger than or equal to 2. We're going to have an ordered simple closed multi-curve uh, on the surface, uh, just our usual setting. And then we're going to have these scaling parameters B that we were considering in our accounting. And Again, as usual, I want to do some sort of translation between the original setting and this new setting, and uh, and then I want to use this translation to motivate the definitions that are going to come. And I'm going to explain now what, uh, sort of quickly review what I mean by each one of these actors over here. So H2 is now going to become the Tig Miller space of marked hyperbolic structures on my surface. The area is going to become the Bay Pearson measure on uh, Tig Miller space. So the SL2Z action now is going to be the action of the mapping class group. And when I look at the quotient H2 mod SL2Z, I'm going to be looking at the moduli space of hyperbolic structures on my surface. And that's sort of what's going to replace that, uh, which is the Miller space module of the mapping class group. And then the area downstairs uh, is going to be Vey Pearson measure, but uh, we're going to see that equidistribution in this setting is going to look slightly uh, different than before. Yeah, so maybe let me quickly review what each one of these um, things mean. So for me, TG is going to be the Tig Miller space of marked hyperbolic structures on a surface of genus G. And by this, I just mean pairs where we have a hyperbolic surface and a diffeomorphism from our base surface XG to X, and everything is up to an equivalence relation, uh, which is basically isotoping the marking. Uh, the sort of Tig Miller space. And this space carries a natural measure, which is the Bay Pearson measure. And a way that you can think it's natural is on a set of geometric, geometrically meaningful coordinates, which are the Fenchel Nielsen coordinates. This measure is uh, literally Lebesgue measure. Uh, there is also this action of the mapping class group. So the mapping class group is a group of orientation preserving diffeomorphisms of uh, the surfaces G modulo. Uh, I mean, up to isotopy, that's what this quotient means. 
and it acts on marked hyperbolic structures by changing the marking, yeah? As this relation that's explicitly written here. But the idea is that it changes the marking, so if I take marked hyperbolic structure and I mod out by changing markings, then what I should get is just hyperbolic structure, and that's what this uh, is saying. So mg is just gonna be the moduli space of hyperbolic structures on sg, and that's what we get when we quotient out take Miller space by the mapping class group. And then finally, uh, uh, when I write uh, the Vay Pearson measure hat, I mean the local push forward of the Vay Pearson measure on Tate Miller space to moduli space. Yeah, you can take a local push forward because the action of the mapping class group is properly discontinuous on Tate Miller space. Yeah, so that's sort of the uh, a brief dictionary of the terminology. So now let me say what horribles look like in this uh, new setting. Uh, so for every parameter L. We're gonna consider a horrible now based at gamma with scaling b. And this is gonna be the set of all marked hyperbolic structures on Tig Miller space uh, satisfying the following constraint. Uh, for every component of uh, the multicurve gamma, I have this restriction that the length of sort of gamma i on the surface x, that's what why the marking is important. The length of the unique geodesic representative of gamma i on x. Uh, is bounded by L times the scaling parameter. Yeah. So what this means is take gamma i, map it using the marking to x, and then look at the unique geodesic representative. And so these are one are gonna be what our horribles are gonna be like. And then just as before, that horrible carries the natural measure, which is just restricting the natural area form, the natural Bay Pearson measure, to uh, this uh, horrible. And so I do that, and now just as before, if I want to, I sort of want to explore how these uh, horribles equity distribute once I push them down to moduli space, but to get something meaningful, I need to quotient out by the redundancies. And in this case, the redundancies just as before were the stabilizer at infinity. Now they're going to be the stabilizer of uh, the multicurve gamma, meaning stabilizing every component. And so uh, we're going to build measures according to the following diagram. First, we have our horrible measure uh, based up here on Tig Miller space. We're going to take a local push forward to the portion of Tig Miller space module of the stabilizer of the curve, just as in the previous example. And once we're here, we're just going to push everything down to uh, moduli space. Yeah. So this gets rid of the redundancies. And then finally, I can take a push forward. And what I'm going to get here is an actual uh, finite measure. Yeah. So that's sort of uh, the rough translation from the original idea of a quiz revision of horribles to this other uh, setting. And once that's in place, uh, here's a theorem that one can prove. So uh, this was proved by Mariam in the case of a simple closed curve and then extended uh, by myself to the case of general multicurves and also other uh, more general settings. And the idea is that uh, with respect to the weak start topology on uh, for measures on moduli space, uh, if I take my horrible measure after doing this procedure to push it down to moduli space and I normalize it uh, to be a probability measure, then this is going to equidistribute, but it's not going to equidistribute to maybe what one would think in first instance, which is just uh, the Bay Pearson measure, but it equidistributes to the Bay Pearson measure uh, with some density function, which is going to be precisely the Mirza Hani function that we mentioned before. Yep, and this VG here is exactly what makes this a probability measure. So after making things probability measures, we witness equidistribution to a density with respect to the Vay Pearson measure. And another thing that I want to mention is that the idea here is that this uh, total measure, total mass of this horrible, uh, if you compute it out and you compute its asymptotics, so that's what this M means, the mass of the horrible. Uh, then uh, if you compute out what it means uh, asymptotically, then what you're going to get is that it's going to look exactly like uh, like the term that showed up in the leading asymptotics of R counting. Yeah, it's going to be the integral over the box defined by the scaling parameters of uh, this polynomial uh, that we mentioned before. Yeah, so that's sort of... Uh, as you can see in this theorem, you witness well all the terms in the main theorem come from. Here you see the Mirzahani function. Here you see the scaling, uh, uh, sort of this uh, scaling factor depending only on the genus, and here you see the factor depending on the curve and the scaling parameters. Yeah. So every part of the counting problem can be witnessed at the level of the equidistribution. So yeah. So that's sort of 
what the theorem looks like, but maybe let me say a few words on the proof, and I don't want to go overly technical, but at least let me mention what's the dynamical input that's behind uh, all these proofs. So, uh, we want to use some dynamical input to prove a quiz distribution, as we mentioned before, and that's going to come from the uh, earthquake flow. So let me try to briefly say what that is and what the properties of it uh, that we need are. So we're going to look at not moduli space, but at the bundle of unit length measured geodesic laminations over moduli space. I've not said precisely what measured laminations are, but you should think about them as some generalization of multi-curves, some sort of completion of the space of multi-curves. And so we're and I want to look at some sort of unit tangent bundle, and I build it by taking hyperbolic structures and then looking at all unit length uh, measured geodesic laminations over them. Uh, this bundle has a flow, which we call the earthquake flow, and the way you define it is by continuously extending uh, fenchel nielsen twists along simple closed geodesics. And I'm going to draw a picture of that in just a second, uh, how the basic uh, earthquake look, earthquake along a simple closed curve, and then you extend that continuously to all laminations. Uh, this bundle also supports a measure, which is called the Mirzahani measure, and this measure has the feature that it's invariant and ergodic with respect to this uh, earthquake flow. That's also a theorem of Mirzahani. And yeah, so we have this measure, uh, which I'm not going to define precisely, but it satisfies this. It's an explicit definition. You can get your hands on it, and it's invariant and ergodic with respect to this flow. And by work of Minsky and Weiss, moreover, we know that this flow is uh, satisfy a strong non-divergence property, meaning that uh, trajectories tend to spend most of their time in compact subsets. Yeah. And ergodicity and this sort of non-divergence property and this whole dynamical setting is what allows you to carry out the uh, proof of uh, equidistribution. Um, and obviously this requires more work than I'm mentioning here. I'm just sort of giving you the dynamical input that you would need, uh, sort of the dynamical setting that you would need to look at to prove this result. And maybe let me also draw a picture of uh, how fenchel nielsen twists look like, because else I wouldn't be even giving you an example of the flow. So here's a hyperbolic surface. Here's a curve gamma. I'm going to earthquake along gamma for time t. What I'm going to do is I'm going to cut along that curve and then I'm going to re-glue it back with a twist so that if this was an arc on my original surface, after I do the re-gluing, it looks something like this. Yeah, so you cut along, then you glue back with a twist. That's what uh, twisting is, and you can extend it continuously to all laminations. Yep, so that's sort of the dynamical input. But let me uh, try to give an interpretation of this previous theorem uh, in a probabilistic sense, because I find it very interesting. So I'm going to describe a procedure for building a random uh, hyperbolic surface for you. And the procedure is going to go like uh, follow. So I'm going to start with a pair of fancy composition uh, of uh, my surface. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to do is that for every, uh, you give me a number L, and I'm, for every L, I'm going to build you a random hyperbolic surface in the following way. So first, I'm going to pick a vector of lengths from this box uniformly at random. That's the first thing I do. Uh, then uh, I have my surface, I have my pants decomposition, I can cut along it, and then each one of the components is going to be a pair of pants, each one of the complementary regions, and I can realize them as the unique totally geodesic, uh, I mean the unique hyperbolic pair of pants with totally geodesic boundary, whose uh, cuffs have lengths given by this vector. Then I'm going to glue them back uh, along the components of the pair of fancy composition with any twist, arbitrary gluing. But then I'm going to pick a vector of twists uniformly at random uh, from this torus of possible twists. And then I'm going to twist my hyperbolic surface according to this uh, vector. And so let me draw a picture to you of how this would look like. Here's my surface of genus 2. Here's a pair of fancy composition. I cut along it. I pick a vector L uh, of lengths at random from the box that I mentioned before. I realize my uh, pair of pants uh, hyperbolically according to these boundary lengths. There's a unique way to do that. Then I glue back with some twist uh, random. I mean, uh, whatever twist I want. But now I pick a twist at random, and then I twist my structure uh, randomly according to that twist to get uh, a new hyperbolic structure. And in this way, I will have built for you 
a random hyperbolic surface whose probability law in the moduli space of hyperbolic surfaces is precisely uh, this measure, mu hat, uh, that we defined before, this horrible measure, uh, normalized to be a probability measure. And so uh, the statement is that in this procedure for building random hyperbolic surfaces that we described here, uh, as I take the parameter L going to infinity, these random hyperbolic surfaces, uh, uh, their law converges weak star to the probability law that shows up all around the place, which is this Mirzahani function times the Bay Pearson measure normalized to be a probability measure. Yeah? Sort of in the case, the, the theorem is more general because it's for. Um, it's for general multicurves, but in the case of pairs of pants, one can give this very simple interpretation of equidistribution being just a statement about how random, uh, uh, how this random construction of hyperbolic surfaces uh, converges to this particular law. Yeah. And uh, let me uh, mention a bit more about the about. Uh, what we know in this direction. So let me now fix a set of weights of uh, on the components of the pansy composition. And in this procedure for building a uh, random hyperbolic surface, now I suggest that instead of picking uh, lengths from a box like we did here, that's what we did in this step, um, step one, instead of picking lengths from a box, I want to pick lengths from a um, from a simplex defined by the weights, yeah, the weights and the parameter L. And then I want to ask the same question, do the same procedure for building a random Riemann surface, by, but pick the lengths with this other randomness, and then uh, do we still see the same equidistribution when we take L going to infinity, yeah? Does the randomness persist in the limit? And let me say that the answer is yes, and again, this is work of Mir Sahani in the case of a simple closed curve, and myself in the more general case, and this would be like, uh, one can also describe this result as equidistribution not for horribles, but of horror spheres. And the answer is yes, the randomness persists. It requires more work than the horrible case. And uh, ideas uh, like uh, inspired in some way by uh, Margulis thickening uh, technique show up. And maybe let me finish this um, uh, talk and also this idea by randomness that maybe now you want to ask what happens when you look at higher code I mentioned simplices uh, when you pick your lengths uh, uniformly at random from higher code I mentioned simplices you still witness randomness in the limit and uh, we have an answer to this question uh, in work in progress but uh, it's a positive answer but it requires uh, sort of making the answer weaker so we can give a positive answer in a weaker sense than, than what we would uh, actually want. There is persistence of randomness when you reduce uh, to lower to higher co dimension simplices, but uh, the answer is not as strong as as you might have hoped in the first place. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is where I want to finish uh, my talk, but uh, let me uh, again thank uh, the organizers uh, for uh, making this whole conference happen and uh, as I know, there's this format where we answer questions and there will be office hours. So uh, I just didn't want to present too many details of the proofs in the slides, but I'm happy to talk about uh, all details uh, in such instance. And I'll be gladly uh, taking all your questions, but I just want to stop the talk here for now. And again, thank you for watching this and thank uh, for the invitation and the organizers for all their hard work. Yeah. So thanks.